uh, way, it's, it's interesting. Uh, that really, uh, we didn't plan it this way, but it so happened that it's all working out in the same way. If you imagine uh, an orange, oh no, excuse me, um, an onion, an onion peel. Well, we're going from the external. This week, the webinars that we've had have been like going from the external really to the core, the basic, the internal. And like if you were on the call on, on Monday, Dr. Eden gave a masterful presentation about the new technology with silver and how that can help protect you against germs and viruses. And that, is, of course, is very important, especially in the days we're living in today with the swine flu wreaking havoc everywhere. But uh, that is just the bacterial or microbes are not the only things or viruses. They're, they're not the only threats that we have to face. And uh, Dr. Marvin, the next day on Tuesday, talked about inflammation. And of course, that is your body's defense against all kinds of threats, all kinds of uh, attacks. And again, he did a great job. Remember, the, the, what is responsible for most of the chronic conditions we have today, cancer, heart disease, asthma, um, diabetes, for most, if not all, the, of them, they start with inflammation going awry, inflammation going wrong. And so understanding how to get your inflammation, infl inflammatory processes in balance and in going in the right direction is crucial. It is crucial for you to understand that. And I think he did a great job. And you can get his information, too, from our website. MP3s of most of our webinars are available on our website. And of course, where tonight we're going to be talking about the immune system. And when you think about it, that's what the, f the first two webinars this week we had were about. It really comes down to the immune system, it comes down to how your immune system functions, because it's the immune system that is responsible for inflammation. It's the immune system, of course, that is responsible for defense against bacteria and viruses. It is the, your first line of defense against disease of every kind. And so it is. So um, it is just. It is, I think it is just fitting that we have someone of Dr. Murray's stature to come and explain to us uh, how the immune system works. And you see how this fits right in our philosophy, right in our focus, in our webinars. And that's right there, number one: how our bodies work. And tonight we're going to be talking about how our immune system works. And so without much further ado, um, first of all, I'm going to show this picture, really. I hope you can all see this. Uh, that's Dr. Murray on the right-hand side, and Dr. Marvin, who spoke two days ago, in the middle. And to his, to his right, our left, we have Dr. Danny Sun, who is a, he's a plastic surgeon and reconstruct, plastic and reconstructive surgeon. And he has done a lot of work with breast cancer cases. And believe it or not, we're going to be having him next week. So it's funny how this has all turned out. Dr. Marvin started on Tuesday, Dr. Murray today, and next week is going to be Dr. Danny Sun. He's coming on to talk about surgery and the importance of nutrition to recovery from surgery, especially breast cancer surgery. And Sherry, would you like to introduce Dr. Murray? Yes, I'd love to. He told me to keep it brief, which is a bit of a challenge with somebody who's a... <laughs> Got so, has, has done so many things. Um, yes. But I, I will yes. do that. Just a minute. I'm try we're, we're having issues every time we try to do screen changes here. But Okay. Dr. Murray, he was born in Scotland. He has an MS in philosophy or physiology. Sorry about that. Um, he has a PhD in biochemistry. And he has um, had a really distinguished teaching career, done lots of research. He's trained more than a dozen graduate students. He's published over 50 peer-reviewed papers. He's authored multiple textbook articles. And he's been the senior editor of the last seven editions of Harper's Biochemistry, which is amazing. And David often mm -hmm. talks about um, that book and how he used it in medical school. So I'm not sure why we're not seeing Dr. Murray's uh, screen yet. Dr. Uh, Murray, do you want me to press? Yeah. Yeah, do the clean screen. There we go. OK, so with all that being said, uh, Brad, I mean Rob, are you there? <laughs> 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 Thank you. It's a little uh, joke. <laughs> no, I, I, 
I look like Brad Pitt, as you can see in the picture. <laughs> uh, actually, Brad Pitt, not Brad Pitt. <laughs> uh, so are we all set? We're all set. It's all yours. Yep. Okay, so uh, uh, the first day uh, just shows the title of the talk, and that's my email address at the bottom. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, but I will be away for the next 10 days. Uh, I have to go to uh, Ireland for 10 days, and I won't be back till about the 15th of, of May, okay? It's not advancing. Uh, um, okay, try try using either the forward arrow, the arrow. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm using. Okay, then but, the other, uh, try hitting your enter key. Okay, enter key, yeah. Does that work? So, um, maybe... Uh, Okay, there's, there's a couple other things we can try. Yeah, Go it was advancing nicely before, but it... Uh, Some, it sometimes once we actually begin the webinar, there's a little bit of a problem. Take your mouse and hover it down in the very bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and you'll see a couple arrows emerge. Well, I, wait, I've uh, got it. Uh, yeah, bottom left is start. Uh, no, a little bit higher than that. Yeah, I'm not seeing these arrows. Maybe oh, I didn't... Okay. Okay, there's, also, the there's one more thing, Dr. Murray. Just right-click on your screen. Okay, I did, yep. Right-click. Yeah, that, okay, it changed the bottom. Maybe it will work now. Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is that it? Um, yes, maybe try going backwards just to be sure. That yeah, that's okay, there we are. Uh, right. Sorry for the trouble. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, address you this evening on... Uh, some basics of immunology, and as I said, if you have questions, you can email them to me. So overall, tonight the objective is to present some basic aspects of immunology, and the uh, immune system is a complex system, so some listeners will have to become familiar with quite a lot of new material and terminology. On the other hand, we'll only be able to touch in quite a variety of important matters relatively uh, superficially. I should say that, as David said, the mind is very important. And in fact, the mind, there are some people that are studying effects of the mind on the immune system. But I will not be going into that uh, tonight, OK? I just thought I'd mention it. So here are some definitions so that hopefully we're clear about what uh, I'll be talking about. So immunology itself is the science that deals with all aspects of host defense mechanisms against infections and against cancer, and also of adverse uh, bad effects of immune response systems. For example, the autoimmune diseases, the condition of anaphylaxis, which is sudden shock after, say, being exposed to a drug to which one is allergic, for example, penicillin, uh, and a variety of others. Okay, So the immune system is the name used to describe the totality of the host defense mechanisms. Okay, And the host, of course, can be human, or it can be other species, dogs or cats, cattle, Every species, uh, uh, animal species, has an immune system, OK? And the immune system then includes tissues. For example, the thymus gland plays an important role in the immune system, as does the spleen, OK? It includes a variety of cells. And um, prominent among these are cells called lymphocytes, OK, which play a key role in the immune system. And then macrophages, which are uh, large cells that eat up uh, foreign material. That's what phage comes from, uh, the Greek phagin, to eat. So they're macro-large cells that can digest foreign material. Okay? And then there's a variety of molecules. And ones we'll be talking about in particular are antibodies, which are now known as immunoglobulins. So I'll use the two terms interchangeably. If I speak about antibodies one minute 
and about immunoglobulins, they're the same molecules, okay? The old terminology that many of us are still accustomed to is antibodies. The newer scientific uh, nomenclature is immunoglobulin. Immuno, the immune system, and globulins are a particular type of protein. And the antibodies, in fact, are all protein molecules. And there's also other molecules other than antibodies. For example, cytokines are like almost like hormones that regulate the immune system. And they play a very important role in the differentiation of the immune system. That is how it matures and also in its regulation. So another term is the immune response, OK? Uh, the response made by the host, which in our case is a human, but it could be, as I said, other species, to defend itself against disease causing uh, microorganisms, for example, bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. And so immunity, then, is the ability to resist infections. There's no need to remember these terms, but I think it's worthwhile knowing uh, or being familiar with what they, what they mean, OK? So when we come to host defenses, there are two uh, major components. One is called the innate immune system. And innate means present from birth. And the other is the adaptive immune system or acquired immune system. OK, that, this is the one that we'll be talking about mostly, the second system. And it has two components. One is humoral immunity. And the term humoral means uh, it's due to molecules circulating in the bloodstream. That is, the antibodies or immunoglobulins. And then the second part of the adaptive immune system or acquired immune system is I should have underlined that cellular immunity, OK, and which mainly concerns uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, and certain other cells. So we have uh, cells, OK, and we have the antibodies are humoral, meaning that they circulate in the bloodstream. Now, the term adaptive, then, uh, this word is used because, for example, before a bacterial infection, there may be no antibodies against the particular bacterium present in the blood, but they appear in the blood sometime after infection. So the body has adapted to the infection to protect itself by making specific immunoglobulins, antibodies, against the bacteria, bacterium. Uh, cellular immunity also is adaptive. So we contrast the innate system uh, with the adaptive system, OK? And the innate system is, in fact, the more primitive uh, system that was present in uh, species before uh, the adaptive immune system developed, OK? Now, the innate system has a mechanical component to it. For example, the skin. Uh, is a barrier to infection, uh, although bacteria obviously can infect the skin. The act of coughing expels bacteria from our upper respiratory system. Uh, they may be trapped in mucus, and then they can be coughed out. The mucus in the respiratory tract, which is a mixture of fluid and uh, certain uh, glycoproteins, okay, it can trap bacteria, and we can cough them up. Uh, sometimes we can flush out certain mi microbes, bacteria, in the urine. And so there are other, also other components that I won't mention that really form a sort of mechanical defense system. Okay. Now, some texts actually separate this mechanical component from the in innate system. They would say there's a mechanical defense an innate system, and an adaptive. Uh, tonight, I have uh, lumped the mechanical in with the innate immune system. Okay, So the innate immune system 
has molecular and cellular components. By molecular, I mean a molecule like a protein or an enzyme, okay, whereas uh, the cells are different types of cells like macrophages uh, that I've already mentioned. So the innate system is an ancient system. Simple organisms have an innate immune system. Its components act immediately because they're already present in our bodies, okay? They're, right now, as you sit there, there's many molecules that participate in the immune system that are preformed. They're there in the body, and they're ready to act to some extent against uh, microorganisms. It is not adaptive, okay? And it does not show what we call immunologic memory, which I'll mention later, okay? The uh, formation of antibodies is adaptive because there may not be an antibody to a bacterium before it, the bacterium infects the body, and then the antibody is formed. So uh, we have adapted to the infection by forming an antibody. The innate immune system is generally nonspecific, okay? It recognizes common molecular patterns of molecules on the surfaces of microbes, bacteria, or viruses, whereas antibodies and cell immunity are specific. An antibody can be specific for one particular type of molecule, as can uh, the immune cells, okay? So the innate immune system contains a variety of molecules. For example, there are certain peptides that a peptide is a small protein molecule. It's made up of a number of amino acids, maybe up to 20 amino acids, whereas most proteins contain more than 50 amino acids. Insulin, for example, has 51 amino acids. So a peptide is really a, a small chain of amino acids, okay? And certain enzymes can also digest bacteria, okay? And there are various cells that are involved in the innate immune system. I mentioned the macrophages, which can take up bacteria and digest them, okay? Uh, they eat up the bacteria, hence the term uh, macrophage, okay? Then there are dendritic cells, which are something like cells of the nervous system. They have a lot of a little processes coming out of them, and they play an important role in the handling of antigens, which I'll define shortly. Then there are various white cells. Okay, Dr. Marvin talked the other night about inflammation. And one of the key players in, in, in acute inflammation, that is sudden inflammation, are white cells called neutrophils. They have granules in them that give them a specific staining property and they can take up bacteria and kill them by a variety of mechanisms. Then there are also cells called natural killer cells that can, for example, attack cancer cells and kill them. Then other components of the innate immune system are a system of proteins called the complement system that I'll just mention briefly in a minute. And then the process of inflammation that Dr. Marvin covered so well the other night, this also comes under the heading of innate immunity because it's already present in the body, okay? And, but I should also point out that certain components of the innate immune system interact and link up with the adaptive system. So the two of them are integrated in the overall uh, defense mechanisms of the body. So they're not completely separate. There are points of interaction where components of the innate immune system will interact with molecules or cells of the adaptive system, okay? So I'll just mention very briefly the complement system, okay? And that's complement with a knee, not with an eye, okay? And in fact, this has been much studied. It consists of a set of some 20 different proteins. Uh, they're called plasma proteins because the plasma is the fluid part of the blood. And basically, 
overall the act to attack various extracellular bacteria, okay? That's their, their major purpose, if you like. And this system can be turned on by certain bacteria or, uh, without going into details, when antibody binds to the surface of bacteria, this turns on this complement system. And the bacteria become coated with certain of the, the proteins, the complement proteins, okay? And this facilitates the phagocytosis, that is, the uptake by cells of bacteria which kills them, okay? Or in some cases, the complement system can actually kill the, the pathogen, the bacteria, directly by uh, the fact that it has enzymes uh, in the complement system that make holes in the surface of the bacteria, and this uh, changes the permeability of the membrane of the bacteria and helps to kill it, okay? So we won't discuss the complement system more tonight, but it is an important area of immunology that has been much studied. Every one of the proteins uh, of the system has been studied in great detail. Much is known about their structure and their functions, and it does have important implications for sustaining health and also for understanding certain diseases. So if you do after uh, this webinar, if you look into a textbook of immunology, you will see that there's usually uh, one or more chapters on the complement system. Now, inflammation, as I said, Dr. Marvin covered that the other night, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, but it is part of the innate immune system, okay? It refers to a process in which fluid from the blood, the proteins in the, in the liquid part of the blood, that is the plasma proteins, okay, as distinct from the proteins in red cells or inside white cells, these are the proteins that circulate in the fluid part of the blood. And certain white blood cells, for example, the neutrophils in acute inflammation, they accumulate locally. And let's say some bacteria get into the skin, un under the skin, then uh, white cells, fluid, the plasma proteins converge on the bacteria, OK, without going into the details signaling that's involved to attract them that have invaded uh, the bacteria that have invaded the tissue, OK? So inflammation can also have non-bacterial causes, injury, or in fact, certain uh, immune responses, antibodies can attract an inflammatory response. The neutrophils can take up bacteria and kill them, so that if you've ever had an abscess, most of us have had little abscess in the skin or elsewhere, well, basically, uh, the material in the abscess called pus is dead neutrophils, these dead white cells that have killed off bacteria, okay? They've protected us from the bacteria by killing them, okay? So inflammation can be acute, okay? And that generally means uh, approximately occurring up to 36 hours after bacteria would infect the tissues. That's a little bit subjective. It can vary are chronic, okay? So chronic inflammation can, as some of you probably know, persist for years. For example, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, you can have a chronic inflammatory process in the joints going on for years. And the main cells in chronic inflammation are not the neutrophils, but they are lymphocytes. So that this, the, the cell type involved in acute inflammation is a neutrophil, okay, the cell type involved in chronic inflammation is mainly the lymphocytes. In general, I think we can say that acute inflammation is a good thing, or it can be a, a, a good thing, because it counteracts bacterial invasion. If we didn't have acute inflammation, then the bacteria could proliferate and, and get into the bloodstream and spread. But also, as you know, it can cause problems. For example, acute appendicitis, the appendix can rupture. 
if you have meningitis, uh, bacteria or viruses affecting the covering of the brain, that is the meninges, then that's a very serious condition, as is pneumonia and a variety of other acute inflammatory conditions. Chronic inflammation, of course, can lead to various problems. For example, joint destruction in rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, Dr. Marvin mentioned uh, many other complications, cancer, uh, a whole variety, uh, cardiovascular problems. There's great interest in that nowadays, the role of inflammation in uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, I won't be talking about that because Dr. Marvin covered that uh, very comprehensively the other night, okay? Now then, the adaptive immune system then, we've more or less finished with what we're going to say about the innate immune system, the more primitive immune system, but the adaptive or acquired immune system has two arms or limbs, if we want to call it that, okay? Humoral in the blood, which is in the plasma, the fluid part of the blood, and these are antibodies, now called immunoglobulins, and interestingly, all of them have sugar attached to the protein part, so they're all glycoproteins. And in our plasma, uh, some people have figured there could be a million different antibodies in our, in our bloodstream, okay? So antibodies are basically made uh, by cells called plasma cells, which develop from lymphocytes and the, the type of lymphocyte that they develop from are called B lymphocytes. And the B stands for derived from the bone marrow. So uh, the cells that make the humoral uh, component of the adaptive system are the B lymphocytes, and they're derived from the bone marrow, OK? So the, the second arm is the cellular arm, as opposed to these molecules circulating in the blood, okay? And these are mainly what we call T lymphocytes. Not B, but T. And T means derived from the thymus, okay? Now, lymphocytes then, the B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes are small cells with a large nucleus, and they're key cells in both arms of the immune, adaptive immune system. They're B lymphocytes in the humoral arm and T lymphocytes in the cellular arm. They look similar, B and T lymphocytes, under the microscope, but they have different functions, and they can be relatively easily distinguished by various lab procedures, and the amount of B and T lymphocytes in the body can be counted uh, by various laboratory procedures. Now, the thymus is a gland situated in the upper part, I should have put their chest rather than neck, okay? So it's the upper part of the chest, and it's made up, if you look at thymus under the microscope, it's made up of a variety of lymphocyte cell, lymphocytes, okay? And it and the bone marrow, as I mentioned here, play major roles in producing lymphocytes. The bone marrow mainly produces B lymphocytes, which mature to make antibodies, and the thymus mainly produces T lymphocytes, which have other roles. They don't make antibodies, but they can defend us against various infections and also, uh, to some extent, against cancer, okay? So humoral versus cellular. Humoral is antibody-mediated, humoral meaning blood. It provides host defense against many infections, okay? Uh, the antibodies can coat bacteria. This is called opsonizing, okay? It's a fancy word, but basically just means coating onto the surface of bacteria so that they're then phagocytosed by uh, neutrophils or macrophages, okay? And the Antibodies can uh, interact with toxins that bacteria make and neutralize them. If an antibody combines with a toxin, the toxin will uh, 
in, in a number of cases will no longer be toxic, so the toxin is neutralized because the antibody has bound to it, okay? And as we'll see, the antibodies are also involved in certain types of allergy uh, that's often called hypersensitivity um, uh, reactions, and also in autoimmunity, where the immune system acts against uh, the body itself, various molecules in the body. So cell-mediated me uh, immunity, these are the two limbs and of the uh, acquired system humoral and cell-mediated. It's involved in host responses against certain infectious agents, for example, the bacterium that causes uh, tuberculosis, mycobacteria tuberculosis, that's been intensively studied now for over 100 years against fungi, against virus-infected cells. We're all quite interested in, in that uh, phenomenon at this particular time, okay? It's also involved in certain types of allergies so that you can have allergies that are mediated by antibodies and allergies that are mediated by cells, and also it plays uh, the cells, the lymphocytes play an important role in the regulation of antibody response by cells that are called helper cells or regulatory cells because their function is to help regulate the immune response. So again, the two systems often overlap and interact. They're not separate that never contact each other. They often ha have a variety of interactions. Some that we'll mention briefly, but we don't have time to go into the details uh, this evening. Okay, so these are key cells in the immune system, the B and the T lymphocytes, okay? The B lymphocytes arise from the bone marrow, hence the name B, okay? They're key players in humoral immunity because they give rise to plasma cells which make the antibodies or immunoglobulins that circulate in the blood and defend us against bacteria and viruses, etc. Okay? The T lymphocytes mainly arise from the thymus, okay, T for thymus. They're involved in cellular immunity. They do not make uh, circulating antibodies, unlike the B cells. And there's a number of classes of T lymphocytes, but the two major ones are what they call helper T cells, okay? They help T cells to make antibodies, and then cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic means toxic to cells. Cyto means cells. So cytotoxic T cells can kill other cells, for example, virus-infected cells or cancer cells. So these are the two major classes of T lymphocytes. I think there's a couple of other subclasses that I'll mention briefly later. So this is a very important distinction in understanding the immune system, the distinction between B lymphocytes, which are, are the precursors of the cells. Plasma cells are just modified B lymphocytes, and they are the actual cells that make the immunoglobulins that defend us, and the other cells are the T lymphocytes, okay? So here's a couple of other important terms, and the more antigen, I'm sure we've all heard of antigens, and we, I know we've all now heard of antibodies, okay? So how do we define an antigen? Well, it's a molecule that binds specifically to a specific antibody, to an immunoglobulin or antibody. And the antigen in most cases is a protein, okay? Uh, if you take proteins, foreign proteins, and inject them into humans or into animals from which they're a different animal from which they originate, then generally speaking, antibodies will be made to each of the proteins. But we can also get antibodies to sugar molecules, for example, to polysaccharides, to certain lipids. There can also be antibodies to DNA. And that can be important, for example, in the autoimmune disease lupus, okay? So we can uh, uh, 
other molecules other than proteins can be antigens, but probably the most important class of antigen is proteins, but certainly other molecules can be antigenic, okay? And large proteins are usually more antigenic than small proteins. They give rise to antibodies, if you like, more easily or in greater amounts than do smaller proteins without uh, exactly explaining why that is, okay? Now, antigens then can be components of bacteria. Okay, the surface of a bacterium will contain a whole variety of different proteins which can act as antigens. Some be more important than others. Viruses have proteins on their surfaces, okay? For example, H1N1, H is, uh, uh, that, that's a scientific name for the uh, virus that we're concerned about right now. H uh, it means hemagglutinin, which is a specific type of protein, and N is an enzyme called neuraminidase, which cleaves the sugar off a glycoprotein. So uh, I think there's about 16 different types of hemagglutinin and nine different types of the enzyme neuraminidase, and the swine flu virus seems to have H1N1, whereas the Asian flu virus uh, is somewhat different. So there's a whole variety of, of, of molecules in viruses that can uh, act as antigens. Now, a very important point, then, is that antigens are not usually made to self-proteins, okay? And this is called immune tolerance. The body uh, tolerates its own proteins. It would be very destructive if the body were constantly making antibodies against its own proteins, that would lead to uh, a lot of nasty conditions, okay? So an immunoglobulin then, or antibody, is a protein that binds specifically to its antigen, okay? You inject one protein into the body and antibodies that react against that particular protein will be formed. These antibodies will generally not react to different proteins. If you injected another different protein, it would make different antibodies. So antibodies are specific for their antigens. Now each immunoglobulin, this is a shorthand terminology for immunoglobulin, or uh, AB is a shorthand for antibody, so IG is a shorthand for immunoglobulin. And there may be millions of different immunoglobulins, but each one has a unique structure that enables it to bind specifically to its antigen. It doesn't bind to other antigens. It in binds to the antigen that was, say, injected or entered the body and to which the antibody was made, okay? But overall, antibodies have similar general structures, even though they're quite specific for their antigen, the overall structure of, of immunoglobulins or antibodies uh, are rather similar. And there are now uh, recognized, this has been known for quite a while, that there's five major classes of antibodies or immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulin G, which is the main one in our plasma, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin M, D, which is present in very small amount, and E, which is important in allergies and asthma, okay? So and each of these uh, classes of immunoglobulins can be measured in your blood. Uh, immunologists in labs, medical hospital labs, research labs have techniques for estimating the amount of the different five different classes, okay? And in some people, uh, genetically, there may be an absence of an antibody, and that can lead to serious infections. If there's no immunoglobulin G, you don't have defense against certain bacteria, and that leads to recurrent infections. And this can be diagnosed by appropriate lab tests. Uh, if you do a lab test, you might find in a few patients that they have no immunoglobulin G. That can be shown by appropriate tests. And I'm, not going to spell out tonight, but 
the bottom line is there are five major classes, and each class has uh, slightly different uh, structures and different functions. Okay, so the structure of immunoglobulins uh, was determining the structure was a major feat uh, in immunology, and two different immunologists played a key role in that, and they uh, shared the Nobel Prize. And if we take immunoglobulin G, what it uh, is seen, it contains two small chains. These two chains here are shorter, OK? And then two large chains. So we say that immunoglobulin G is made up of L2, two L chains, which are identical to each other, and two heavy chains, OK? which are identical to each other. And the light, the so-called light chains, these are the smaller chains, OK, they were called light. They have uh, a variable, a B region here, and a B region here, and a constant region here, and a constant region here. And the amino acids in the variable region are diff uh, differ among different molecules of immunoglobulin G. So that's why it's called variable. Then the heavy chain has a variable region right here. And then it has three different constant regions. And the two halves of the molecule are joined by this chemi type of chemical bond without going into the details. So this is the, the immunoglobulins in general. They all have this Y-shaped structure, OK? And the part of the molecule that binds antigen is this part here. This will bind the antigen up here. And in fact, it's this region here, in, uh, in this region here, that binds the antigen. And if you look at uh, this particular region here at a higher power, if you like, the structure of, of all the amino acids in these chains has been determined. In, for a number of antibodies. And it's known that the site that binds antibody is what is called hypervariable. And so that the pattern of amino acids in the hypervariable region is what determines the specificity of binding to antigen. One antibody will have a slightly different sequence of amino acids to another, and that will make it specific for its antigen. So the, the establishing this work, which was done by a variety of immunologists interest, because antibodies are such key structures in immunology, it was very important to identify their structure and their function. But recognizing that this is the antigen binding site, and that, in fact, it's made up of differences of amino acids, this was a key contribution in understanding immunology. And this area is called the hypervariable region, OK? And that is the area that binds the antigen. So antigen binds up here. The other parts of the molecule have somewhat different functions that I want to address uh, tonight, OK? So um, it's not, there we are. OK, so a few points about immunoglobulin G, which is the major antibody in our blood. The overall structure is like a Y. I showed you that. The two, there's two light chains, OK, which are identical. And each one, if you remember, had a variable region and a constant region. Then there are two heavy chains, which are identical. And each one had one variable and uh, one constant region divided into three parts, OK? And these three parts are called domains. That's just a, the term that immunologists use to describe parts of the immunoglobulin molecule, OK? And it's the variable regions of the light and heavy chains that bind antigen. And each of these variable areas has three hypervariable regions. And uh, when they, uh, the way they fold in a three-dimensional structure is what provides a specific site to bind antigen, OK? So the, the, the other regions of the heavy chains have other functions, OK? They can bind complement. I mentioned complement earlier. Or they can bind to cells, OK? 
uh, but the, the C regions of the light chains have no known functions, okay? All of the immunoglobulins are proteins. In fact, they're glycoproteins. Proteins, as you may know, are made up of specific sequences of amino acids. And it's probably getting a bit tedious, but it's a specific sequence of amino acids in the hypervariable regions that determine which specific antigens are bound to an antibody. And every different antibody, and there may be a million in our body, has a different pattern of amino acids in the hypervariable regions. Okay, without you may ask, well, how is that possible? Well, there's, it's because of uh, different genes in our body that are involved in antibody formation can come together in a whole variety of different permutations, million or more different permutations, and it's this, the genes that provide that make the sequence of amino acids, so that we have. We can have a million different antibodies, each with different specificities. It sounds amazing, uh, and it just shows you, again, as we know, how complex our bodies are, okay? But it took a lot of hard work and research by a whole variety of immunologists to, to work this out. Okay, so the other immunoglobulins, I won't say too much, uh, the, the, moly, the part that is different in the other ones is the heavy chain. The light chain is common, okay? Now, the molecule, one of the five types was IgM, and it, in fact, has five light and, and five heavy chains, so we call that a pentamer, penta coming from the Greek five, okay, uh, when it circulates in the blood. The L chains are common to the five classes. What is different between the five classes of the heavy chains. In, in IgG, immunoglobulin G, we have a gamma chain. In A, we have alpha. In M, we have this uh, mu. In D, we have delta. And in IgE, with the molecule involved in asthma and allergy, we have the heavy chain is called epsilon. These are Greek words, OK? This is a detail that I won't uh, uh, mention, but there are Basically, each of us is either a kappa or a lambda light chain, and they're just slightly different in amino acid sequence, okay? So what are the major functions of the five classes of immunoglobulins? Well, IgG is the major antibody. About 65% of the antibody in our blood is IgG. And it's a major antibody in the secondary response to antigen, okay? Uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. The first molecule made when we're exposed to an antigen is not IgG, it's IgM. But later there's a shift from IgM to IgG. So IgG is the major molecule in the secondary response. Okay? I mentioned that IgG can coat the surface of bacteria. That's called opsonization. It can fix a complement, which can be important in certain diseases. And immunoglobulin G can bind with bacteria with different antigens on bacteria or antigens and viruses. By binding to them, it can neutralize the toxic activity of the bacteria or viruses. Then another important aspect of IgG is that it is the antibody that crosses the placenta. The others don't conferring some immunity on the fetus against infections, okay? So this is the major antibody in our blood. And each of the major classes has different functions. Okay, IgA, immunoglobulin A, is present in secretions, for example, in our gastrointestinal tract, genitourinary tract, etc. And by being secreted into the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, it can prevent uh, bacteria attaching to surfaces of cells in these locations. And if the bacteria don't attach, they may not establish infection. So that is uh, a good action of uh, immunoglobulin A. Now, immunoglobulin M, as I'll explain in a minute, is the antibody involved in the primary response 
if you inject an antigen into a human or an animal, the initial antibody formed to the antigen is IgM, and it later changes to IgG. IgD uh, its function is not quite established, okay, it's only present in a very small amount. And IgE, you may well have heard of because it's involved in hypersensitivity reactions, for example, allergies and the very serious condition of anaphylaxis. It's believed that initially this antibody defended against worms, for example, tapeworms and other various helminths, which is the medical word for uh, worms, okay? Now, this is uh, trying to explain briefly uh, how we can make so many antibodies, okay? So this is uh, a cell. This is a B cell here. These are B cells, okay? And this particular, uh, uh, all of the B cells have receptors on their surfaces. Okay, but only there may only be one particular uh, type of receptor that fits the particular antigen. When we inject an antigen, it finds its receptor. Okay, it will not bind with this receptor because this receptor is not specific for the antigen. Neither is this one. Neither is this one. But this one is. So the antigen binds to uh, the cell. Okay. And then that cell undergoes repeated divisions, okay, uh, cell divisions. And this is called clonal expansion. This one cell, by multiplication, forms a whole colony of cells that are derived from the cell. So that's a clone, okay. And this cell will secrete immunoglobulin M into the blood, okay. These other uh, cells although they have uh, uh, receptors on their surface, okay, to, uh, uh, to IgM, they do not react with the antigen. So when an antigen interacts with a B cell receptor, it causes the B cell that it interacts with to divide, forming a clone that makes antibody against the antigen. Here's the antibody comes out of the cell into the blood, Okay, and this is the IgM uh, molecule. So the IgM is far, was already, if you like, in the receptor, but when this, when this cell is stimulated, it makes a lot more IgM, and some of it gets secreted into the blood, okay? Now, helper T cells, without going into details, and specific cytokines are involved in this response, okay? Because antigen can be recognized by a number of different receptors, a number of different lymphocytes divide, and each clone makes a slightly different antibody against the antigen. So the, this, this antigen may combine with another receptor, and that will make a slightly different antibody. So the, uh, the antigen, in fact, contains a number of sites that can lead to slightly different antibodies being made against it, okay? And so this is called polyclonal is because there's a number of antibodies slightly differing in structure being made to the antigen because there are different sites in the antigen molecule that are antigenic, okay? So this type of antibody is called polyclonal, okay? So the whole specificity depends on the fact that there's receptors on these lymphocytes in our body, okay, there might be 10 to the diff, uh, 10 to the seven different B cells in our body, each with a different antigen receptor on its surface that will recognize antigen, okay. Now, this uh, this shows the result of an experiment in which an antigen is injected, say, into human. The first antibody appearing in the blood after seven days, this is seven days after injection, is IgM. And then you see IgG appearing. So there's what is called a class shift. It shifted from IgM to IgG, OK? So this is the primary response, OK? 
this is the secondary response is this shift from IgM to IgG. Now, if subsequently you then expose uh, the human or the animal to the same antigen, what happens is that immunoglobulin G and M are formed much more quickly on re-exposure. And so we call this immunologic memory. This is what I mean by memory, is that the, se is the uh, response to a second exposure to antigen is much more rapid the cells that respond have remembered that they were previously exposed to antigen, okay? And that does not occur in innate immunity. So IgM is the first antibody that occurs, but the second uh, response, the secondary response is IgG, which is a, prom a predominant antibody in our blood. And this uh, illustrates immunologic memory, the fact that antibody is made more rapidly. You can see here it takes a week. Here it's only taking a couple of days for IgG and IgM to be made. Okay. Now a whole, uh, a very interesting series of antibodies have been made uh, by laboratory techniques and the people that de developed these so-called monoclonal antibodies this has been such an important contribution that they also received a separate Nobel Prize in medicine. So how do you make a so-called monoclonal antibody? You may remember, I'm not sure that I explained it that clearly, that the, re the result of injecting an antigen into a human is that you get a number of antibodies with overlapping specificities that is called polyclonal. It's not one pure uh, uh, bunch of molecules. It's slightly different, reacting to different parts of the antigen. But you can make so-called monoclonal antibodies. And how do you do this? Well, you inject an antigen into, say, an animal, a mouse, okay? Then you take out the spleen, okay? You take uh, lymphocytes out of the spleen, and then you, t you mix uh, the spleen cells with myeloma cells. Myeloma cells are tumor cells that have an uh, infinite lifespan, okay? Many tumor cells in tissue culture will continue to divide more or less forever, okay? Uh, they're being what is called, they're immortal, okay? So you can fuse one of these cells here, a spleen lymphocyte, with a myeloma cell, but you mix the population, and then you add a chemical that causes the two different cells to fuse. So this cell here, uh, this large cell, contains one of these cells and a myeloma cell. Okay, this one here is a different uh, spleen cell and another myeloma cell, etc. And these fused cells are called hybridomas. They're hybrids, hybrids derived from this cell and this cell. And then they can be grown in tissue culture. This is a tissue culture dish, okay? And you can actually select out one cell. You can dilute a suspension of cells so only one cell is in the uh, tissue culture dish. And that will grow indefinitely um, by making a clone, okay? A single hybridoma cell is placed in the well and then it multiplies and then you can, it secretes antibody into the fluid medium around the cells, and that can be collected, and that will make an antibody that is quite specific. Uh, it's not polyclonal, it's a monoclonal antibody against the antigen of interest, okay? So you may have heard of monoclonal antibodies, and they're becoming widely used uh, in clinical usage. You may hear about this. Uh, I think David is going to be running, uh, uh, addressing cancer therapy, among other issues. And these monoclonal antibodies are becoming very important in the treatment of certain uh, uh, cancer cells, but other conditions as well. For example, there's one with the commercial name of infliximab. MAB stands for monoclonal antibody. The antigen is this cytokine, which is called tumor 
that causes factor alpha. It's one of these cytokines that regulates activity of the immune system, and it's been shown to play an important role in the pathology of rheumatoid arthritis. So if you give a monoclonal antibody that reacts with this antigen and neutralizes it, this has been shown to be of use in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Another monoclonal antibody, this indicates it's monoclonal, MAB, trastuzumab. The antigen that it's made against is called epidermal growth factor. This is a molecule on the surface of breast cancer cells. So this monoclonal antibody against this particular antigen has been shown to be of use in breast cancer. So tumor necrosis factor alpha is a cytokine, that is a hormone that uh, regulates the immune system. It's important in the pathology of rheumatoid arthritis, which damages the joints, and the monoclonal antibody neutralizes this cytokine and prevents it doing uh, uh, it having its toxic effects. The EGF receptor is an important receptor in some breast cancer cells. The monoclonal antibody binds to this receptor and knocks it out, okay, and this interferes with the growth of the cancer cells. And a cytokine then is a protein made by one cell uh, that affects the behavior of other cells, although tonight we're dealing mainly with proteins that are made by immune cells and affect the activity of other immune cells. And in fact, there's about a minimum, a lot more now than 50 different cytokines in the human body that are regulating the immune system. They play a very important role in regulating the immune system. And in fact, sometimes in conditions like influenza, there may be a surplus, a great excess of cytokines formed for reasons that are not clear, and this can cause a so-called cytokine storm, which can uh, uh, have serious effects for somebody in which this occurs, okay? So some of you may have seen this term, cytokine storm, okay? Now, monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal antibodies uh, are widely used as lab reagents. Monoclonal antibodies are more specific, because monoclonal antibodies are directed against just one particular part of the antigen, whereas polyclonal are similar but directed to a number of different areas of the antigen, okay? So here's a usage here. In some cancer cells, different antigens, uh, surface proteins occur in cancer cells that are not in normal cells. So if you have a monoclonal antibody specific for this antigen, okay, here's the antigen, Here's the monoclonal antibody that binds to it, tightly binds to it. And if you attach a fluorescent dye onto the monoclonal antibody, you can then detect the monoclonal antibody binding to the cancer cell by using a so-called fluorescent microscope. Okay? So antibodies are widely used for various lab tests, for example, to recognize types of bacteria. I'm not going to talk about that. The above shows one use. In this case, a cell is being tested to see whether it contains a specific surface antigen. For example, many cancer cells contain antigens not found in normal cells. If the cell contains the antigen, it will bind specifically to the monoclonal antibody and will be detected by this dye that has been chemically linked to the antibody uh, uh, chemically, so that you can see the antibody attached to the surface of the cancer cell, and that would uh, confirm that this is a cancer cell. But that's only one of many hundreds of different usages of antibodies. Okay, now some diseases in which immunoglobulins are involved, if levels of immunoglobulin G are very low, for example, there's some mutation in the genes that make the immunoglobulin, a child or adult is very susceptible to recurrent infections, okay? In some cases, 
immunoglobulins are formed against components of our tissues, for example, proteins, damaging them and causing a variety of autoimmune diseases. And there's well over 70 of them, uh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, MAT, multiple sclerosis, et cetera, et cetera. If you go to any uh, current textbook uh, of, of medicine, you'll see there's a, a huge number of uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. Then anaphylaxis, then, I mentioned that before, severe profound shock can occur to an antigen, for example, penicillin, and this involves IgE. And uh, the basic pathology is massive release of various molecules, including histamine, from particular cells in the tissues that are called mast cells, okay? Uh, here's uh, an illustration then of anaphylaxis. This is a mast cell that contains granules uh, that contain histamine and other molecules. On its surface, it has uh, a binding site, uh, has a receptor that will bind immunoglobulin E. Okay, I said that IgE is involved in anaphylaxis. Okay, then if an, an allergen that binds with IgE uh, is exposed to the cell, this brings the Ig, these two IgE molecules close together. It cross-links them. This changes the membrane, and molecules are released from the membrane of this cell. This is called a mast cell, histamine. And if there's massive release of the various molecules in the mast cell, this can cause anaphylaxis, okay, which is sudden circulatory collapse. and you have to get an injection of epinephrine or uh, adrenaline immediately or other treatments because if it's not treated immediately, it can be uh, fatal, okay? Now, there are many conditions that cause immunodeficiency, okay? Some are congenital or um, genetic, and some are acquired. For example, I think most of us probably know that HIV infection causes a diminution of specific T cells, CD4 cells. You've probably uh, heard or read about that. A very important factor that I'm not going to talk about tonight, but in maintaining the uh, quality of the immune system is, of course, good nutrition. That could be the subject of a, a whole separate uh, talk, okay? As we know, radiation can damage, suppress the immune system. Okay, you can have deficiencies of certain B cells. You can have deficiencies of T cells. In some patients, there's a combined deficiency of B and T cells. You can have deficiencies of certain uh, components of the complement system that I mentioned early in the talk. You can have, uh, in some cases, there's deficiencies of certain phagocytic cells. If they're not available, they will not eat up uh, invading bacteria. So in almost all of them, there can be serious infections that may occur, which can be life-threatening. So there's a variety of immunodeficiency disorders and, that you can check out for yourself if you are interested, okay? So now we're coming to the last topic, which is relatively complex, okay? This is uh, cell-mediated immunity. And there's a few terms here that I'm sure some of you have heard of, but others may not. And very important proteins in cell-mediated uh, immunity on the surfaces of lymph lymphocytes are the molecules called the major histocompatibility complex. And it's these molecules that determine whether, for example, a transplant will take if uh, two people have very similar molecules in their major histocompatibility complex the transplant will take. If they have differences in the structure of these proteins, then this can cause uh, rejection of the transplant. So this is a cluster of genes that is known to be on chromosome 6. It encodes a set of membrane proteins. These are present in the membranes of lymphocytes 
They're glycoproteins. They contain sugar, okay? And these are called major histocompatibility uh, complex molecules. And there's two major classes, okay, class one, and this presents peptides to lymphocytes called CD8, okay, T cells. And then the other major class are class two uh, molecules, which present peptides from broken down, for example, viruses that have been degraded to peptides to CD4 T cells. So CD is an antigen on the surface. Uh, CD8 is a particular antigen on the surface of, of T lymphocytes, and CD4 is a different antigen, and they can be uh, detected by appropriate anti antibodies. This one you may have heard of because a drop in CD4 T cells is what happens in um, HIV infection, and of course that can lead to severe immunocompromise uh, of, the, of a patient who, who has HIV infection. So CD just means it's a bit complicated, the terminology, cluster of differentiation, that's what it means. But basically, it's a cell surface molecule, almost always a protein, that is recognized by groups of monoclonal antibodies that were raised to the surfaces of cells, okay? So CD4 T cells carry this protein on their surface. CD8 T cells carry a different uh, uh, molecule, CD8, on their surfaces. And so these are two major classes of T cells, okay? Now there's another term here which is uh, a little bit complex, okay, but it's called epitope or antigenic determinant. And this means a site on an antigen that is recognized by an antibody or antigen receptor. I mentioned before that uh, molecules can raise polyclonal antibodies. So generally, when a molecule is antigenic, the, the site, uh, there can be a variety of different sites on the antigen, each of which can be antigenic. But in general, a site of about five or six amino acids is called an epitope and an antibody can be raised to that, so that is called an antigenic determinant. So a large protein can contain a number of different epitopes, okay? Uh, I can't uh, change the terminology, and if you do, or if you are interested in immunology, you won't go very far without meaning the term epitope. Now another type of molecule that you might have uh, heard of are interleukins, there's a whole variety of interleukin 1, 12, a uh, whole variety of them. And these are basically cytokines produced by white blood cells. Leukin is white, okay? So these are a subclass of these cytokines, which I told you are very important, like almost like hormones that regulate the immune system, okay? Then another class of uh, a type of cell that's important are so-called antigen-presenting cells. And these are specialized cells that can process, they digest antigens into little peptide fragments, and then they put these peptide fragments onto the cell surface, okay, with other molecules, and this stimulates T cells to be active, okay. And included in antigen-presenting cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. And all of these present antigen that turn on T cells, okay? So the cell-mediated arm, I think, is more complex to understand than the antibody, but I'm trying to give you the basics, okay? So in terms of another, some more terms are on the surface of T cells, there's T cell receptors, and these are proteins on the surfaces of T cells that recognize antigens and play a key role in regulating the functions of T cells. I mentioned macrophages, large phagocytic cells of great importance. They can present antigen to T cells. Cytotoxic T cells, these are cells that can kill other cells. Most are CD8 cells, 
a Q or CD4 cells, okay? Then differentiation, that's just the process by which unspecialized cells or tissues become specialized for particular functions. Then types of T cells, uh, helper cells, cytotoxic cells, there are cells involved in memory because T cells, like antibody responses, show memory. And then there's also cells whose function seems to be to regulate the cell immune system. And these are called regulatory or suppressor cells. Then in hypersensitivity reactions, that is like allergies, you have immune responses to normally harmless antigens that can lead to symptomatic re reactions if you're exposed to the antigen a second time. And as I indicated before, anaphylaxis is an extreme example. And allergies are milder examples of anaphylaxis. OK, so this is really the core of cell-mediated immunity. I um, apologize if it's a little bit complex to understand. But here we have a virus-infected cell, OK? On the left side here, if you look at it, this is a virus, OK? The antigen on the surface can be uh, interact with an IgM receptor. That's similar to the diagram I showed you earlier, OK? This is in the B cell. And this can lead, as we talked about earlier, to antibody being formed, initially IgM, then later IgG, OK? So this virus can act like an antigen and cause the formation of antibody. OK, over on the other side, we see a somewhat different fate of virus. The virus is released from the virus-infected cell. OK, here's the virus. It's taken up by a macrophage, these cells that digest. This is a fragment, a peptide fragment of this virus indicated here. It is then displayed on the surface of the cell bound to this class II protein. I mentioned the class II proteins. Here we see the fragment, the peptide being displayed on the surface. Okay, The receptor on the CD4 cell interacts with this viral epitope. This is a small fragment here, peptide fragment. It causes the CD4 cell to make interle uh, interleukins that stimulate B cells to make antibodies. And this particular interleukin here is also released from the CD4 cell. It goes to the CD8 cell, OK? The CD8 cell then, under the influence of this particular interleukin, uh, it will then react with this virus-infected uh, cell that has a fragment of the virus displayed on its surface, OK? This stimulates the CD8 cell, and it can release molecules that damage this virus-infected cell that cause cytotoxicity and can kill this cell, OK? So it's quite a complicated process. You can read the legend at your interaction, but the major players are antigen-presenting cells, macrophages, the class II and the class I molecules, histocompatibility complexes, CD4 and CD8 cells, cytokines that are called interleukins. The B cell makes antibody. The T cells uh, end up, the CD8 cell is cytotoxic, OK? And in fact, the people who worked out the role of class I and class II, uh, how they cause uh, viruses to be killed or uh, cells to be killed, uh, this uh, idea of uh, the viral fragment being displayed on the surface, they also received a Nobel Prize because this was critical in understanding cell immunity. I apologize for the complexity of this, but uh, that's the way it is. OK? This is a bit simpler now. OK, tolerance then means that an immune response to a certain antigen does not occur although the immune system is functioning properly. Antigens that are present in the embryo, OK, or in the fetus in utero, 
are considered self and do, usually do not stimulate an immune response. Antigens that are not present in birth but are then encountered after birth are usually considered non-self and usually stimulate an immune response. Okay, the major players in tolerance, this phenomenon of uh, self and non-self, are uh, the T cells, although there is also B cells are also involved to some extent. And the main mechanism establishing tolerance is that most T cells that react against antigens in the fetus are killed off in the fetal thymus. Okay, this is called clonal deletion. Any T cells that react against self-antigens are killed off in the fetus, or most of them are, and they're deleted, okay? And because this occurs in the thymus, this is called central tolerance, the thymus being central in the uh, cell-mediated immune system, okay? Some peripheral non-thymic tolerance also occurs because not all T cells pass through the thymus. But we'll not discuss the detailed mechanisms of clonal deletion, but this is a very important phenomenon in the immune system, the distinction between self and non-self, okay? So in autoimmunity then, tolerance can be lost, resulting in autoimmune reactions causing autoimmune diseases. And without going into the details, the major factor causing loss of tolerance is the activation of self-reactive uh, CD4 T cells that react against self. Some of these seem to persist and can be activated. Normally, hopefully, they're not, okay? And these cells can either uh, induce either cell-mediated or antibody-mediated reactions, okay? Now, why these cells are activated is an important issue. This would lead to the understanding of autoimmunity, which is a very important phenomenon in disease. We do know that genetic factors are important because autoimmune diseases often run in families, okay? Most autoimmune diseases are due to autoantibodies rather than to uh, cytotoxic T cells, okay? And a main part, as you probably know, of treatment of autoimmune diseases has been to reduce the patient's immune response using steroids, which of course can have side effects or other immunosuppressant drugs. And other approaches that are uh, being used are specific monoclonal antibodies, taking off plasma from a patient who has an autoimmune disease, okay, because the plasma contains autoantibodies, are, uh, without going into details, it seems in some cases giving high doses of immunoglobulin G can also be effective, okay? So overall then, uh, the immune system contains an innate system and an adaptive system. The innate is more primitive, although important. The adaptive is two components, humoral, antibody-mediated, and cell-mediated. The bone marrow, thymus, and lymphocytes, among other tissues and cells, are very important components of the immune system. The adaptive system shows immunologic memory. The innate system does not. Antibodies can react with a variety of molecules and neutralize, knock out their bad activities. For example, it reacts with proteins and bacteria and viruses, prevents the, vi the bacteria and viruses uh, doing their uh, nasty things, okay? T cells also react with various microorganisms in cancer cells to kill them, for example, cytotoxic T cells. Monoclonal antibodies, which are more specific than natural uh, polyclonal antibodies, are finding wide use uh, both as drugs to help treat in certain conditions and also as lab reagents. Normally, the immune system does not react against self. When it does, this results in a variety of autoimmune diseases. And other medical conditions involving disturbances of the immune system are immunodeficiencies, a variety of them, allergies, 
uh, asthma and anaphylaxis, which a lot of them involve immunoglobulin E, as I showed you in the case of anaphylaxis. So uh, these are uh, current books on immunology. I mainly use this one for some of the figures, OK? And there's likely to be, well, this is a very recent edition. I think this is an excellent book, but it's probably been, there's probably a seventh edition out there. And of course, you can get material from the web on immunology. So I've tried to present uh, an overall, an overview of the immune system. Yeah, there, are, there are a lot of complexities in it. I apologize if I, um, some of it was a bit obscure. The cell-mediated immunity is perhaps more complex to understand, but hopefully, if you're interested, you can use this material that I presented as a takeoff point. So I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Murray. This has been very, very enlightening. Um, folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and type uh, type in the box to your right. I've actually typed to, a message to one of you, and so please uh, type in your questions. While you, while I'm waiting for them to to ask the questions, um, I have a message from Robbie Robin Sully who says, "Hang on, let me just." Oh, in uh, Brisbane, Australia. Yes, he says, these webinars are so good. Can we have access to them via your website or at another date so that we can educate ourselves? Professor Murray, we love you and your help for so many. Your humility comes through Robin Sully XXX. <laughs> uh, she's a, a very beautiful lady in uh, Brisbane who has very beautiful daughters. I oh, met her uh, uh, several, quite a number of occasions, and actually I stayed in her house. Uh, actually, I paid her to phone in and say these nice things. <laughs> <laughs> you did, huh? Well, she's, she's making it worth your while, for sure. <laughs> Not really, but uh, I thank her for the comments. Yes. Um, I had a question of my own, really. Um, you know, speaking... Um, coming from medical school, throughout medical school, um, there are some things that we just didn't learn about immunology. And one of the things that really stand out to me was um, the fact that over 70% of the immune system is in the gut. Yes, uh, I should have mentioned that, yeah. Why, why do you think that is so? I mean, that just seems to me, and, and, and when we're talking about the gut, we're speaking more about the colon, right, not the small intestine or the... the well, the, even the, remember the appendix, uh, I think if, when you're a med student, if you looked in the appendix, you saw it was full of lymphoid cells. So right. there are these uh, pious patches all along uh, the intestine. And, I mean, one simple... Uh, uh, explanation which uh, isn't that profound is uh, of course there's a lot of micro when you consider the number of bacteria in the body so many of them are in the bacteria in the in the gut okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not uh, saying that's a uh, complete answer but uh, uh, th that's a very important fact that I did omit to mention is that 70 percent of the immune system is in the gut, uh, mm -hmm. and as David rightly pointed out. The, the other thing that stood out to me, too, was uh, the fact that the immune system is not just about bugs, vir viruses, and bacteria, but uh, it, it actually functions as a so surveillance system, a system that um, checks out the, the status, the moment-by-moment -moment status of the different cells, make sure they're okay, and it's like a, almost like a messenger stroke sentry system that helps to repair damage, helps to uh, uh, help the other cells recover. I mean, that's, that, that, that even goes away from just the general antimicrobial. Uh, yeah, right, the whole question of recognizing cancer cells early and, uh, you know, it's evidence that uh, cancer cells are constantly being uh, killed off as they arise, although obviously uh, they often overcome that, uh, and they're able to to proliferate. Uh, another a point, uh, not quite directly related to that, but I just wanted to re-emphasize it is the 
importance of nutrition in having a healthy immune system. And particularly, you see that in third world countries where malnutrition is prevalent. And a lot of these kids suffer very serious recurrent infections because their immune system is compromised by malnutrition. So I, I think that's a very, and, and interestingly too, uh, in relation to the pandemic uh, that it did occur in 1918 when various estimates of 20 to 50 million people uh, being killed. Now whether it was all virus or some of it was secondary bacterial infection, I don't want to get into, but some people say that uh, because it was in World War I, low standards of nutrition, which often exist in wartime, uh, made people more vulnerable to, uh, to um, infection. Sure. Well, Sherry, you have any questions how you came through? Um, yes, there, there are a couple. In fact, this is sort of funny, Dr. Murray. Somebody said that they're, they're thankful that you don't give us a test after this. But <laughs> well, I, I can if they, uh, if they want it, but uh, I prefer not to. Okay. Uh, we, we, we prefer not to, you too. Yeah. <laughs> we can post our scores online. <laughs> What's that? Then we can post our scores online. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that some people will be uh, intrigued enough to look into the immune system and the whole question of self-recognition. I mean, that was a major problem in Im immunology. And uh, as I said, the people that showed the importance of the uh, major histocompatibility complex in presenting uh, peptide fragments and epitopes. That was a key uh, experimental result in cell understanding of cellular immunology. There's still a lot, as in every field, that we don't know much about. I mean, we're lucky if we know 1% of what's going on. But my viewpoint is that the more that is known, about basic mechanisms, and the more rational can become treatment, et cetera. That if we know some nutrient is missing, then uh, by uh, appropriate experiments, then it can be provided. Or, uh, so I like to think that understanding how disease processes occur will further uh, their treatment. Mm -hmm. Here's a question, uh, Dr. Murray. It says, I had triple negative breast cancer in my blood work, showed no tumor marker, even when the tumor was still there. I assume this means that my immune system wasn't making any immunoglobulins against the tumor. Are there some reasons my immune system would have behaved like that? Um, well, it's possible genetic, but you would, I would have thought that, uh, you know, a tumor marker we get into the blood, uh, certain tumor markers do get into the blood independent of the immune system and they can be measured. So uh, um, I, I'd have to know more uh, about the, the, the person's particular medical history, et cetera, to, to answer that question uh, in, a, in a better, better manner. Uh, right. Right. But re certainly receptor status is an important uh, a thing that can be measured in, for example, breast cancer cells, and that, that can determine appropriate uh, therapy. Someone asked a question. Uh, it seems like it's a, very, it's a, it's a wide the answer will probably be a very wide one, but what what is the best way to boost immune system function? Well, overall, without uh, I don't want to get into immunization, and I mean I know that some people have uh, negative views on uh, on vaccines, etc. My own uh, feelings are. Uh, I'm, I'm more positive than that because I remember when I was uh, a kid in Scotland back in the 40s, okay, that so many, every summer, uh, there were epidemics of polio, okay, 
and you couldn't go to the swimming pools, and uh, uh, they were closed down. People went into iron lungs, and then the polio vaccine was developed, okay? And so uh, similarly with smallpox, uh, there were often uh, sailors from different countries arrived in Glasgow, and sometimes it was quite difficult to distinguish between chickenpox and smallpox, and vaccination, I think, played an important role. But I guess the problem, there are problems with vaccination that some people do have very serious reactions to vaccines that can cause neurologic and other problems. So overall, I think for most of us, uh, um, keeping in good nutritional status and, uh, you know, it's up to the individual whether they take vaccine. There's a whole question of our kids getting too many vaccines and uh, that might be uh, involved in autism. These are very contentious issues that I'm not an expert. I'm familiar with the issues, but uh, um, on the other hand, if the level of immunity, if people stop being immunized, then I personally feel that the level of protective antibodies will decline and that some diseases will reoccur. So I'm not pushing immunization uh, myself, okay, but on the other hand, I think as a public health measure, uh, certainly it has been important in uh, community health, but I recognize that there are problems uh, that can occur, and if you have a child who had a severe reaction to a vaccine, then uh, I mean that's a terrible thing. Mm. Right. But uh, there's all kinds of committees of uh, prominent, eminent immunologists and other people studying this, and then uh, so it's a very, it is as I'm sure most of the listeners know it's a pretty contentious issue, although um, I'm not as negative as some. Mm -hmm. Here's a question about steroid drugs. It says, what are some of the side effects of steroid drugs on the immune system? Well, they certainly suppress the, uh, they help kill off lymphocytes and uh, they suppress antibody formation. In fact, that's why they're used in many autoimmune diseases, but they also have other effects that are not related to the immune system, you know, causing edema, causing osteoporosis, so that nobody wants to be on a powerful steroid for longer than is necessary. In some cases, they may be necessary to suppress a very uh, severe immune reaction, but uh, you can easily access, uh, access information on the side effects of steroids. I mean, generally people, their face swells up, they get edema, they, you know, they are powerful, potent drugs, and uh, uh, in general, if you're going to be on them, the smaller the dosage, the better, because they do affect uh, the immune system, but they also affect many other systems in the body. Well, Thank you very much again, Dr. Dr. Murray. I think that, that, that wraps it up for the questions. Um, okay. Hope, and uh, well, you, 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 gave, you gave your email address, right? So people can still yeah, uh, have an, uh, contact you. Yeah, they might you. not get an answer uh, if they do email me. Uh, if they email immediately, then they might get an answer. But I'm, I'm going away on Saturday for uh, 10 days or so. Have so a wonderful trip. A big pardon? I said have a wonderful trip. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to Ireland, which uh, uh, my wife's over there already, so um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, <laughs> the um, the flu, you know, flying in airplanes, but I guess uh, I've got the ticket, so I have to go. You've got to use it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this may be my last webinar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Murray. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you. Uh, I hope it wasn't uh, way above your heads that you got something out of it. Thank you. Thank oh, this you. was very good. Very, very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Look after yourselves.
Bye. We will. Bye-bye then. And, uh, Folks, you have a great night, and uh, next week we are going to be starting a, a series of, of webinars on cancer. So look out for the invitation and look out for the information. Right, Sherry? Yep, and spread it to everybody you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night.